is that they are Brand Center alums. And I can't say enough high, highly rated things about these guys. They're talented, they're passionate, they're fun, um, and I can't wait for you guys to hear what they have to say today. So, Jordan and Drew. Can you, guys, can you guys hear us okay? Hello. Okay, great. Um, seriously, this is, um, when you're going through Brand Center and you're like, you know, sitting in the audience and you're like, one of these days I'm going to do a Friday forum. And it's going to be amazing. And then that day happens amazing. and you realize it's the most terrifying shit you've ever done in your entire life. But it's an honor to be here, seriously. Um, I know this is mandatory, but thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> The crowd looks fantastic. I would love to know who canceled in order for us to be here. Um, we'll talk about that afterwards. Uh, it was probably something great. Um, so um, what we're going to do today is talk to you guys about um, our paths and kind of what we did um, after Brand Center, um, what brought us to where we are now. Um, and we're going to kind of tell it through what may be familiar way may not be familiar of these choose your own adventure stories from way back in the day, um, thus our format. Um, so we're just going to kind of roll with that. And if you guys have questions, I know it's the most cliche thing in the world to say, but please um, don't hesitate to kind of stop and ask us as we go, because we kind of feed off of that. If we just get to talking, we just talk the entire time, um, which can get boring. Yeah. I'm going to start off first. Uh, I graduated in 2010. Saturday or whenever you graduate, and I started at Wyden that following Monday. That was a horrible choice. After you graduate, take some, <laughs> take a week or two to recuperate. Um, worked at Wyden for two years. I went out there with a partner, Jared, who I graduated with. Got to work on a lot of cool brands, Nike, Levi's. Did a lot of Target work. We promptly lost the Target account once I joined it. Uh, <laughs> that I did for Avengers. Sold a lot of Avengers toys and things like that. Uh, had a lot of fun. Did a lot of plane rides down to San Francisco to go talk to Levi's, but there was a lot of PDFs that got pitched, a lot of stuff that was a little draining after a while, guys. You get on a plane all the time and have to go show people your ideas and do it again the next day, and I spent a lot of time in the studio working on PDFs. Um, so while I was at Wyden, there was a lot of cool stuff happening in Portland. I night out the whole time I was there working on other projects with smaller companies there. One such company was Polar. Uh, at night, I was helping them launch. There was three employees. I went there. Left wide and joined Upstart Polar. Uh, it's a camping company. We make knapsacks, tents, backpacks, any and everything you need to go camping with and some stuff you don't. That's not me, obviously. That's an adventure guy. He works on crabbing boats. I don't have legs like that. Uh, <laughs> Polar, Polar was a blast. We were working out of a closet. I did everything there to staple catalogs, design bags, anything to be relevant in that company. When you're a small startup, they'll, you have to do any and everything to get the job done, and that's what I was doing at Polar. And we'll talk a little more about me and them later in this presentation. Um, so kind of a similar path. Um, graduated in 2009 at the height of the American economy. Um, so <laughs> my, class, my class was basically gifted jobs. Um, I was really fortunate to get into an amazing agency at Butler Shine out in San Francisco. Um, so moved out there pretty quick, not the next day, but pretty quick after graduation. And worked on the Mini USA, Mini Cooper, BMW business. Um, it was amazing. Uh, it was a really great place to work. I think Butler Shine is still like Outside Magazine's best agency to work at. Um, really amazing folks. Learned a lot. Got to apply a lot of the stuff that we learned here. Um, and it was great. And then um, I got an amazing call from the big leagues uh, from a little company called Lego, a little family-owned company called Lego. Um, and we left the Bay Area, which was extremely tough to do, and moved to Connecticut, which is a frigid, horrible place. <laughs> Forgive me if anyone's from Connecticut, but I couldn't hack it. Um, and worked uh, for the Lego group. And I was a senior marketing manager. And I had an amazing job. My job was basically to design the advertising, marketing, and experiences for all the Lego branded stores. So my job every single day, my brief was, let's design something that a nine-year-old boy would love to play with. Um, and I had a team of five that were just as passionate about doing that. So. Um, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity, um, which obviously begs the question, why the hell would you leave something like that? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, it was certainly both of these paths for us that kind of led us down the direction of not only, not only loving retail and kind of what goes along with that, but then leveraging what we learned here at the Brand Center to basically take retail and build brands around that, which we um, you know, give full credit um, to our time here. Um, so 
upon bailing and leaving a amazing paycheck, uh, stable path, all sorts of stuff, um, my wife, who I met at the Brand Center here, um, left Connecticut to the warmer climate of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and when we got back, we basically had no plan whatsoever. Um, and we'll address that shortly as well. Um, that is not a piece of advice. Um, so we moved back, moved back to Richmond, uh, promptly moved in with my in-laws. Again, think hard about that move. Um, we lived with our in-laws for like six months while we were finding a house in Church Hill. Um, and I would sit at like my in-laws kitchen table like every day, like in my sweats, being like, okay, Today's the day the idea comes. I'm going to start a business. Um, and that was actually how Shine kind of came to be. Because I did like, you know, the piece of paper with the line down the middle, things Jordan likes, things Jordan doesn't like. And the two things that I really, really liked was drinking and design. Um, both can be very volatile if you're unemployed. <laughs> um, so basically combining those things and then actually leveraging the stuff that Don had taught me was like, okay, look for the market opportunity here. And so it was like, I think that there could be a better beer growler. It's super niche, which is a great place to start when you're building a business, is to you know, serve a passionate kind of crew. And so that was kind of how Shine begun. Um, and we'll talk about its evolution a little bit as we go. Um, also quickly realized that I was not gonna be able to do a manufacturing company out of my home. So upon moving back to Richmond, having no job, we decided to buy a house and take out a lease on a studio. The, yes, there are, there, there are absolutely cash flow problems. Um, so the pictures on the right are basically of Eastern Land Collective, which is another uh, venture that I own. It's basically a collaborative creative studio, similar to a co-working space that is incredibly tight-knit. So the idea being that you still have all the differences that come with co-working, but because it's so close, it's an incredibly trustworthy environment. So you can throw your ideas out there, you know who's going to listen to them, and you can kind of get a pitch back. Um, Lucky enough to have some amazing partners, also alums that are also involved with Eastern Land. These guys up here from Sylvain Labs um, are partners in the studio and have been with us for almost two years now. So uh, they help keep the dream alive. Drew was a partner for a while until he had to go and be selfish and start his own business. On to me being selfish. Uh, Roaring Pines, I've been working nonstop for the last five years, 24 hours a day while working for other people some days, uh, trying to get Roaring Pines off the ground. Originally with Polar and some other brands, I, I learned how to build e-commerce websites after hours and wanted to get these small American manufacturers off the ground and in front of more people because a lot of them were just hitting the skids and not being able to survive. So Roaring Pines started off with getting American manufacturers online, giving them a place to hang out and sell their wares basically. I quickly found out none of them cared uh, they all wanted to be in Lowe's. They all wanted to have a huge, massive account, get the target, um, sell in Walmart, things like that. But they weren't reaching out to this younger audience. So I got jealous of building all these websites for other people and built my own Roaring Pines. I was doing this while I was at Portland, um, in the office at Polar after hours and things like that. Um, quickly, Jordan and I shared a warehouse at ELC for a while, packing boxes. I had to ship rooms all over the place, which go out in snowboard boxes. You lose a lot of money that way. Uh, Finally, after a while, I just went, I got a lot of local orders. I was hanging out, so I launched Roaring Pines up in Union Hill. We're at 21st and Venable. We've got a soda fountain and all the American manufactured home goods you could ever need. That photo's not of me being smug. It's me freaking out and hoping the photographer leaves. <laughs> we don't have that candy wall anymore. All the old ladies bought it all. Uh, it's been great. But yeah, that's where I am now. Every single day, even on the days off, I'm there 24 hours a day. We'll talk more about that. Today we're here to all this self-deprecation and jokes we're making about ourselves to really educate you guys on the stuff you're not going to be able to read in a business book or anything like that. There's a lot of unspoken rules that go into this. We're not startups anymore. I'm not sure we ever are or ever will be. Uh, we're not tech-based. We're not going to be on Target or anything like that. Like some of our peers, like we're having a blast together with each other and, and figuring this out. Um, we're here to tell you all the awkward stuff that other small startups and entrepreneurs Right, this is the antithesis of a TED talk, where it's extremely motivating and exciting. Uh, we're going to tell it's you the realities talk. of stuff, but we do end on a high note, and there is some amazing stuff. So it's there's, if it was all negative, we wouldn't be doing it. We're not complete idiots. <laughs> that was good, not a good joke. segue. Uh, yeah. it's, it's now or never. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. You guys will find this out for yourself when it's right to go, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. I had a very clear path. I had a very some would say cool job. I was working for a young startup. We were in an office. 
just making wacky stuff and going on adventures all over the world. Um, we don't actually get to go on the adventures other people do. We stay behind the computer and share those photos. Um, so that being said, you don't know when you're going to want to escape. You'll be daydreaming like I was the whole time. You're at someone else's successful job. And sometimes you just leave for no apparent reason. You stop trying to impress your parents and just walk out the door and see what the next adventure is. So in, in my case, um, again, like I said in the beginning, I worked for an amazing company like Lego, and I still believe that it's an amazing company. Um, and for the three years that I was there, I did really well. I had a, I had a great opportunity to make work, to meet great people, to travel, um, and, and kind of have all of the things that come along with what we consider like the client side stuff. Um, but after you do that for a certain amount of time, um, burnout absolutely starts to set in. And for those of you guys that have worked or you know, are kind of going into it, um, I know it must be crazy to be like, oh my god, I would love to work at some of these places. But the reality is, is that like, a job can sometimes be a job. And what happened for me was you know, I was just grinding it out. And what, what I started to realize you know, kind of in the third year as I got to higher level is that I spent zero time making things. Um, I spent the majority of my day in conference rooms like pitching ideas that would launch in 24 months with no guarantee that they were ever going to launch. Um, I spent a ton of time, so I had a team of five. So I did more work filling out HR forms and doing like one-to-ones and like manager reviews than I did actually saying, hey, let's try this, let's do something new. Um, and you know, like the other, the other thing that like I, I just personally just never had the ability to tolerate was like my manager reviews, you know, where I would sit down and I would get the compliment sandwich and they'd be like, Jordan, you are doing some really great things. You're also not doing some really great things. But we really would like for you to stay motivated. And, you know, and eventually like that started to just wear on me. And it was, um, and it was the kind of thing where like I don't, I'm not an entrepreneur at heart. Um, and I'll kind of speak to that a little bit later as well. Like I'm terrified every single day. Like I don't, I like to mitigate risk, not take a bunch. And so that's what I'm doing on a day to day basis. Um, but Kim and I decided that, um, you know, we didn't have any kids at the time. I only had tens of thousands of dollars of brand center debt. So I was like, I didn't worry about it. Um, <laughs> you know, so like there was really no risk to be taken. So we were like, i you know, I told Lego, I said, look, you know, I feel very strongly that I need to do this rather than spend the rest of my life wondering if I should. Um, and I think it's a testament to an amazing company. They said, you're absolutely right. You need to go do it. Spend as many years as you need to. There'll be a job waiting on you if you want to come back. Um, so again, if you guys ever want to go work at Lego, hit me up. I can't guarantee you'll get in, but I'll at least make some introductions. Okay, so now you're the idiot and you've quit your job and you're out on your own and you have to deal with all this newfound freedom that Jordan and I... Uh struggled with day to day. So good luck. <laughs> so I had a I had, you know, like I've told you all, I was working on this every day behind the scenes, right before I went to bed. If I went to bed I'd be working on this. I was very hands on with all that stuff. You don't know what you're gonna run into with trying to build this dream. I was just shotgunning ideas out there and eventually found a lot of American manufacturers kind of hiding in the deep dark reaches of the web who needed a brand and things like that. So I spent you know, this is a good example. I spent six months working with a dustpan company to try to make it more exciting. I now sell and ship dustpans every day. Uh, and here's an example of said dustpan. But these are just kind of the things when you quit and you have all this freedom, you don't know what you're going to run into. You don't know what your business model is going to be, what's going to stick. I was seeing what was going to stick and what made me happy. And apparently this dustpan was the nexus of happy and working. He, he's not exaggerating. He talked about this dustpan every day for six months. Okay. And he had multiple versions of the dustpan. It comes in 12 and 16 inches. Yeah. <laughs> so unlike Drew, and, and if you're going to follow a model, I would absolutely say, like, before you make this leap, have some semblance of an idea for what you want to do. So like I said begin in the beginning, like, we bailed, moved back to Richmond, and every day I spent staring into this void of possibility. So I had all the freedom in the entire world, and I had no clue what to do with it. So I was completely like just, I would look into this, this, you know, this void and be like, okay, what are we going to do? What is the idea? And for me, that was a, almost a paralyzing um, lifestyle for a couple of months because you are just presented with all of these pieces of you know, opportunity. Like you talk to people. Like I remember the second week I got back to Richmond, I met with Earl. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Any chance Martin could hire me while I'm figuring this stuff out? You know, it was like, I mean, it was like, 
And so like I didn't really have a direction. So you know, if there's a takeaway from this, from this piece, it's, it's to think about something from Drew's perspective in that you know, have an idea. It doesn't have to be anything other than like, okay, I would like to put some time into this. This is something I'd like to investigate. This is something that might kind of have a revenue stream to it. And that's like a best case scenario. But just some semblance of a direction. Um, I wouldn't change. I absolutely would change. I take that back. I would change everything about the way I started this business. I would absolutely have an idea before. Um, I think it was a growth opportunity, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, Moonlighting Island, guys. There's. I've already touched on this a lot, but you're working for a lot of people to make your own dream happen every day, and that's. I'm still doing that. Uh, it's not all dustpan money that makes me look this good. So this is like my Gollum precious picture. So anytime anybody looks at it, it's like, it's my precious growler. Um, so similar to Drew again, uh, or dissimilar, I suppose, um, is that once I had Shine, I said, you know, there's no way that I'm going to have an interest level to do uh, other work or get a job and do this at night because I was, I was so passionate about it. I said, you know, expenses, mortgages be damned. You know, we're going to make this work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit distribution. I'm going to figure out a supply chain. And I, it is going to require 100% of my attention to make it happen. Um, Again, not a recommendation. Um, if you think about like really kind of the, the, the complications of adult life and really what comes into it and saying, okay, I'm gonna go completely speculative on this idea and I'm not gonna do anything else, um, you get not only to the bottom of your bank accounts very, very fast, but you also get to the kind of the brinks of your sanity very, very fast as well. Um, and so I eventually did shift into like more of a freelancing kind of model, which was where ELC really did come in. but. Um, you know, it's a decision that you guys are going to have to make compared to someone like Drew who has taken a, a, a completely different route. Can you imagine <laughs> buying a book that had websites printed out in it? This is my one work plug throughout this book. Um, this is the site I did for Tanner Goods. I made a lot of these e-commerce sites. Tanner Goods is a rad company out of Portland. They've been doing it forever. They started in a shed, basically. And now they, they have a bar and a few different stores all over the West Coast. Um, I... His office and you know, wanted to talk to him about the bomb factory, how to start your own place. I'm a second year brand center student. I know everything. Uh, <laughs> it was the shortest meeting I ever had with Fenske, but the most honest. He said, don't do it. Do it out of your garage, and if it works, maybe do it in a few years after that. And I listened to that advice, believe it or not, and I have not stopped working to try to make Roaring Pines a reality. So. When I go home this weekend, I'm working on a Polar launch. Uh, all our new apparel comes out on Tuesday, guys. Get ready. Uh, and this is what I've done to keep Roaring Pines alive. You know, I don't have, I can't stare at Roaring Pines all day. I just don't have that luxury. But the, the goal and the drive is there to keep Roaring Pines alive. And right now, I'll do anything like building e-commerce sites. And I just started a new one last week. And that's what it takes to make this all happen. And it's a lot of moonlighting. But at the end of the day, I get to revel in my new shiny toy, Roaring Pines. So I think the you know big takeaway for this is to really kind of have the confidence in yourself in that like what you're going through right now is making you an amazing multitasker. So hopefully you guys are beginning to see that ability kind of really kind of float to the surface and being able to manage five to six projects at once. And I think you need to put some stock in that ability and recognize that it also is a different skill that other, than other people have that are coming from similar uh, industries. Like you all should consider following a passion at the same time, multitasking on the things that are also keep the lifestyle realistic. Um, so this is a really big one. So okay, let's say you know, you've got this business idea, right? And you've written, you know, you've written your business plan, your 15-page business plan that you cut and pasted from another business plan you found in a template online. Um, and you know, and, and, there's, and there's traction, right? Like you've talked you, to your friends about it. You've talked to people that you don't like about it. And everybody's kind of giving you the same feedback. This is a really cool idea. And you're like, all right, well, now how do I get this thing started, right? And so a huge turning point in the life of really any business is the decision to kind of roll alone or take on partners. Um, and it, no matter what decision you make, it brings its own trials and trepidations with it. Um, there's massive advantages and massive disadvantages. And so again, in that we have a similar kind of path from where we started to where we are now, we both diverged dramatically in kind of how we got to that point. Um, for me, in launching a stainless steel product company that required manufacturing, that required supply chain, that required massive fabrication, I needed a lot of money. Jordan did not have a lot of money 
uh, after he spent six months coming up with this idea. Um, so for me, it was an absolute critical piece that not only did I look for partners, but that those partners really kind of came at it from an investment and an equity side, right? Um, that's another plug that I'll give for Richmond. Um, this town is full of people that are interested in businesses and are interested in funding those businesses. Um, it took me legitimately, guys, maybe two months to find my investors. Um, it took another six months to finalize the operating agreement, but they were you know, philosoph philosophically on board. Um, I am extremely lucky that not only did I find partners and people who are now invested and have a stake in Shine, um, but that we actually still work very well together. Um, and there is, like there's a tension relationship there, right? Because those guys are in this to get a return. Like there's no question about that. There's never a joke about it. But at the same time, they also recognize this is a totally speculative piece. It's a super niche business. Um, and at the end of the day, if shit gets scary, I still call them and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And they never judge because they've typically gone through it four or five times before. And they're like, try this, this, and this. And I can't tell you how invaluable that has been. But it also comes at a price where a percent of every single dollar I make doesn't come to me. And you got to kind of come to terms with that at some point because you're the one that's working your ass off every single day for these folks that kind of made it happen. So there's kind of an internal struggle that you kind of have to deal with unless you go a route similar to Drew. I'm so lonely. Uh, this is apparently the only photo of me in the store. <laughs> I'm always there, though. <laughs> he stands right there every day. It's my serious face. So I, I, I made a conscious decision early on that I was going to do this by myself. Uh, and now I just sit quietly in the corner while Jordan has his meetings. Uh, but I did align myself with Jordan. Uh, when I first came back to town, I was working out of work labs. I had a desk back there for three months. And it's really surrounding yourself with people who can support you. But I did make the decision to not take investors. The opportunities have come up. I don't owe anyone any money. I don't have awkward dinner conversations with my parents about when they're getting their money back or anything like that. I can just go through this. I've completely separated it from my family. But at the end of the day, when you're talking to yourself in the mirror about what your next choice is, you end up making dustpans and buying lots of rooms. <laughs> uh, and I've learned a lot through this. But there, going back to Jordan's point and how important Richmond's been to our growth, it's it's a major thing to take advantage of right now, guys. You get a text? No, I was just checking the time. Okay, okay we're good. cool. We're good. Right where we're All supposed right. to be. Yeah, good. So, yeah. First sale and beyond. This is some scary stuff, guys. Uh, <laughs> there's no way to recuperate from getting that first ding on your phone about a sale that just came in like Jordan's did. So we are constantly packing orders now, but that first one makes it super real, and you have to recover from it quickly. Shout out to uh, at Wes Hates. Follow him on Instagram. He helped put this wall together. He's also a second year. So I chose a different path, like Jordan, unlike Jordan. I'm fine with where I am right now. I don't have a growth plan or anything like that. I'm just going to let the sales roll in and keep adding American manufacturers as it goes along. And you guys, when you start up your business, you have to figure out where your happy point is. Um, so. Completely different for me. I've, I noticed a lot of you guys coming in today with swell bottles and hydro flasks and stuff like that. And I want you to know that every time you buy a hydro flask, my daughter doesn't eat. <laughs> okay? I want, you to leave, I want you to leave knowing that. I saw every single one of you guys. Um, the business that, I, that, I've, that I've started building only works at volume. Keep that in mind. Uh, only works at volume. So for me, um, it is kind of this almost um, relentless trudge towards success, right? So the first sale came in, um, and I remember who it was. His name was Ryan Roberts. He was a CBM here in my class. Uh, he lives in Alaska, so he crushed me on shipping on my first order. <laughs> it was such an ass move. Um, I lost money on that sale because Ryan had me ship it to Alaska. Um, but, you know, it's an amazing thing to say, like, I've put something into the world and people are engaging with it, right? Like when we, when we started Shine, I made a hundred of these things and like we sold them out in like two weeks. And that was like a hundred people. That was a hundred people that were like, all right, I'll give it a try, you know? And like, so for me, it, like that, that was such a, a motivating factor. And then you start to really get into the details of like manufacturing and supply chain. And as you guys, some of you guys may know, like the only way manufacturing works is at volume. Like it's so difficult to manufacture one thing or 10 things or 100 things. Like the way you start to make this stuff work is when you start making 10,000 of something. Um, so for us to actually get to that point, 
um, not only requires a massive sales effort, a massive distribution effort, um, along with the brand building piece, because ultimately that's what people are buying into. Like they love the idea that they bought, people, people want to buy things that they, that they love, right? We're kind of shifting away from this mindset of like consumers and we want to really have owners, you know? Like for Shine, it's like I don't want just people who are buying this and are going to kind of toss it out. Like I want people who are going to buy it and own it. Very similar to the stuff that Drew, like it has a story and it means something. It doesn't necessarily have to mean something to everyone, but it does mean something. So in terms of that first sale, um, celebrate it while you have it because it does mean something massive, but it also means that the path just got a lot steeper and a lot more serious because not only do you have to make more now, but you have to service the people that have bought whatever it is your idea was. Oh. This is a good cover. This is yeah. our favorite. Uh, you guys are building your own future when you decide to start a business, so plan ahead, which neither of us did apparently. But make sure you design where you're going to live comfortably. Don't overpromise. So that's what I'm here to talk about right now. You know, my goal is to make American manufacturers prosper. I sell all the boring products that you guys use every day, um, and that's what I do. I have some bad news. I have a broom manufacturer that went out of business uh, in July, third generation. So I didn't sell enough brooms, guys. So that's what I have to live with every day. Yeah. But those are the last of the brooms. They're all gone now. But these, you know, these are. This is the future that I planned for myself, and this is what I'm taking care of. So every day when I go into work and I stare at all these brands on the wall, I know each and every single story about them, and I'm collecting them. But this is, you know, whatever my goal is with business, this is what I always fall back to, and this is what keeps me psyched on Roaring Pines. So when you go along with your business, make sure you're choosing a path that makes you psyched every day, and that's, that's what my brooms are. That's what brooms mean to me. Uh, if you look at kind of the story that, that, that you know, my path has gone on um, up to this point. Um, in my mind, as I think back around the decisions that I've made, the first thing that comes to my mind is how unbelievably irresponsible I was um, when starting this, right? And, that, and that's life sometimes. Like, sometimes it's okay to be irresponsible, right? So sometimes it's like okay to take risks that don't make a lot of sense. So by de facto, by, I don't think that's the right word, but the way that I look at myself, I am not an overly responsible person as it comes to a massive amount of things that I go through in my life, right? Like I have my priorities, like I know, you know that my family comes first and you know, to make sure that you're experiencing this one shot that you have at life. But at the same time, there's a massive irresponsibility that's built into everything that I do. So for me, when I am thinking about like, what's the responsible move to make? What's the responsible move for growth? What's the responsible move for what my partner's gonna need? Um, coming in the future, I have to beat basically uh, a biological instinct to shrug that kind of stuff. And so when we talk about the metaphor of the prisoner of responsibilities, as your business grows, the responsibilities only get bigger. The stakes get much larger. And so you realize the responsibility that kind of comes along with that um, is, is, is massive. And so you really do design the cell that you end up living in. Um, so be very thoughtful about. Can I get the door? Should we let him in? Great point, though, Jordan. Oh, <laughs> it's like Sorry, it's, it's a beautiful. sell. It's a sellout. They can't yeah, get in. Yeah, yeah. Is this me? You go. I think it's me. Phantom money, guys. Uh, this is something that's very real, and there's no sexy way to talk about it because no one likes talking about money. I'm sure, it's a very expensive piece of art they're hanging. Uh, <laughs> This is what it takes every day to keep Roaring Pines alive. I've already talked about how I work all night and work all day. I'm constantly making uh, sodas and selling brooms out of the shop. But this is what it all comes down to, and no one wants to talk about it because it seems unsexy. Uh, but to grow Roaring Pines, I keep having to spend all my money on my next idea. It's always about growing the business. If I, I you know, I'll be honest, I'm smarter than Jordan. I got an accountant from day one. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. It's uh, true. But they helped me, and they, they tried to talk me out of this. But the, the goal with Roaring Pines is always to keep growing American manufacturing. So you go ahead and open up a brick and mortar to show it off even more. And you have no idea where your money keeps going to. But there's a lot of sneak attack stuff that take your money away. So when you guys start thinking about this new business or where you're headed, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. It takes money to make this happen. So always have that in the back of your head. It's not sexy. It's not cool. You're not going to read about it in a book, this one apparently. And... Um, 
just really quickly, like the supply chain for Shine is the most complex, ridiculous, uh, frustrating thing ever in that we use a combination of fabri fabricators, manufacturers from around the country. So the supply chain is extremely complex. Like every single growler has four hands on it before it's finished, um, which would just make any like actual manufacturer or retailer cringe because there's so much work that goes into them. Um, and that's, but that's for me, that's an important piece, right? Like it's finishing it the right way. It's doing the right stuff to make a product that is good for the rest of its useful life. Um, that said, um, when I first started making these growlers, again, thanks Ryan Roberts for buying one, um, I was basically breaking even on every single unit, right? Because I made up this supply chain. Like I was driving around Virginia um, in a Jeep with growlers in my trunk, you know, and I would take them to one factory and I would drop them off and then I would leave it for two days and then I would come back to Richmond. Then I would drive back to that factory and pick those growlers up, take them to another factory. So if you don't even think about like my time or like the gas money that I couldn't expense to a company that didn't really have the money to expense it to, the, the time, effort, and actual resource costs that go into starting this stuff, and even to this day, is, is, is massive. It's absolutely massive. So for me, we're still, like we like I said in the beginning, we started making 100 of these at a time. Now we manufacture about 4,000 at a time. And that's still tiny, tiny numbers compared to like what all these manufacturers are going to want. So for us, hitting a profitability point is a very scary, and not terribly far off, but still far off um, vision for what the company is. So in terms of phantom money, um, the cash flow of Shine um, looks terrifying. It looks absolutely terrifying. And the only reason I felt better is I really recently read Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog. If you haven't read it, buy it, read it today. Nike was bankrupt for like 30 years before like they actually made it. So I kind of think I'm like Phil Knight and I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to go just as well and we'll build a campus, but it won't be like athletic, so it'll be like really unhealthy. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, danger on Family Island. Uh, we've alluded to this one a little bit, um, but both of us have uh, wives and we have kids. Um, and the most important thing, whether it's, uh, you know, I think this applies in Brand Center as well to those of you guys that have families, is remember that your families are along for this ride. Um, and, you know, that they are just as much at stake in your life as, you know, this little business or this idea that you have. Um, so this is my wife, Kim, and this is my daughter, Ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Six months yesterday. Um, for me, um, I don't have. I, I, I've never really been able to do like a work-life balance thing. Um, I am stressed out at work, and I bring that stress home. Um, you know, and it's and it's and I have an amazing partner that can mitigate that stuff and say, "Wake up, man! This is ridiculous. Like you're you're worrying about like the plastic mold of a you know of a of a screw cap. Like you're not curing cancer." I don't think, I don't think, I might be. Um, but you know, like it's for me, and, and certainly as a piece of advice to you, as you know, you get into your careers, especially when you guys get into like entry level agencies, they're going to work you like crazy. Like you will work 12 hours a day. It'll go by like in a minute. You won't realize you've been there for 12 hours. Um, but the important part in my advice in, in this kind of piece is, you know, make sure that you either have a separator from you know kind of what your stress levels are professionally versus what your personal life is, um, and I think that Drew's actually done a much better job of that as kind of compartmentalizing in a way. I also have a cute photo of my wife and my son, but I have this broken jar here to represent <laughs> all the nonsense that happens day to day with my business. Uh, my son knocked this one over while he was there visiting. I let him leave without cleaning it up because he's only 18 months. But this is, this is the kind of stuff that you guys have to think about now. Um, always, always hug your loved ones that are taking care of you, even if it's at the brand center or during your business, and figure out how much you want to have them involved. Make that conscious effort to have a separation. I chose early on that I love my wife, and I'm going to not plug her with I all the stress. I actually don't. <laughs> I don't remember her name half time. All, all the stress that comes with work. So I've, you know... I'm not at a rocket ship to the top. This is a slow, steady climb for me, but I've decided to keep my family off to the side and keep that free, and we have weekends and things like that. So as you build your business and decide what you're going to do, decide if it's five years of insanity and that's when you need to hold on or if it's a slow climb and you guys can have a normal life and you can just internalize all that stress until you explode in front of a room of 300 people. <laughs> until you're in front of a, a bunch of classmates one day and you just out freak here. out. I have to go to work and clean. 
trail of lost time. It's so real, guys. You don't know what's going to come in front of you, what's going to suck up all your time. You have all these great ideas, and then it's the day before your presentation, and you have no idea what to do. That, that, that was us. not us, actually. We, we prepared for this. We've already presented this multiple been times. We've been on tour. Uh, so this is what my store looked like before. I signed a lease on this store in February of 2015, and if anyone's doing math, I didn't open until February of 2016. So that's a year. That's a year of me telling people that I was going to open a store, and by the sixth month, no one believed me. Started writing me off. But this is the Love Church. It was like that for 40 years. And it took me a year to get plumbing, electrical, and to make the building stop falling into its own basement. But this is all stuff that you didn't expect happening. Um, I spent three months just trying to get the health inspector there. You guys don't know what's going to jump in front of you, whether you're a tech startup, selling growlers, selling brooms, something weird's going to jump in front of you, and you just have to be able to take the slow and steady route and not pass out from stress. You will lose more time than you could possibly ever, ever, ever imagine, and you have to remember that's actually the most valuable thing that you have, and if you, you can apply that equation to any aspect of your life, and it's manage your time, you know, it's really curate where your efforts go. Um, for, for me, um, this was not what I saw in my head when I started like a premium designer growler company. But the boxes are like what they ship in. Like I didn't even think about that. I never even considered like what they were going to move in. I was just like, I'll make these growlers and things will work out. Um, but this is really what life looks like, right? And I'm, I'm happy with that, like because it, it represents growth and it represents revenue. And then, you know, ultimately it represents like me building something that has volume. Like this was an order for some company that ordered a thousand growlers. A thousand growlers. Like I didn't know what to do when I got that. Or I was like, well, let's freak out. Let's, <laughs> let's shut I ourselves in a fun. room for a little while and like deal with it. But at the same time, in terms of lost time, um, like there's only so much that you can really spend time exploring. So whereas, you know, like you find the unexpected things, whereas for me, like I know what that goal is, right? So like I know that I have to hit X amount of volume in order for this thing to truly work and for me to like be able to actually have a legitimate reason to stand up here. So I can't keep kind of going on the sideways exploring things. Like, you know, I think us as creative people think about like, what's the next thing? Like, what's the next product innovation? Like, where do we want to go next? What's the lateral tangential move? And I can't do those things because I can't afford the time that goes into them because I have to be so focused on kind of the end game, I guess, is, is the best way to look at that. Deep secrets. Yeah. You guys can read. It's a, it's a true place. It's real. This is all the little, you know, secret handshakes and head nods all these young entrepreneurs give each other when they're not crying. There is a, there's a code. We can't talk about it. Yeah. I get excited about weird stuff like this. That's this is, Drew's dad. <laughs> that's not my dad. He's, my dad's not that cool. That's Evan. My dad's pretty cool. A live feed. Uh, <laughs> that's Evan Roberts. He uh, has a company called Broomcorn Johnny. He is uh, one of the few American manufacturer broom makers left in the country. There's a broom corn shortage, so they don't make brooms here anymore, guys. Every acre of broom corn makes 60 brooms. That's depressing from a business model standpoint. That doesn't work. Uh, but these are the people that make me excited every day. This guy's crazy, 20 years making brooms. Uh, I was on the phone with the, the grandson of the wiffle ball bat guy. I am constantly calling up grandmothers to ship me apparel and gardening tools and things like that. They're, American manufacturing is, a, is an old business and there's no one new picking it up. But every, time, you know, every month I find a new company that's been doing stuff for 100 years that I get excited about. Or it's a brand new startup on the West Coast or something like that. And you have to find all these little pieces of joy, like this crazy guy who's been doing it for 20 years. And that's, that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing. And those are some of the secrets that we all share and those little pleasure points throughout this weird and wacky journey we've had. Interesting side note. Here's a, here's a tip. The, the, the worse the website, the better the manufacturer. True story. They don't have time for websites. Yeah, like if it looks horrible, they're great at manufacturing because they, do, they put zero time into their website. So it's like, let's just make these trash cans. And like they're probably the best trash cans ever. Um, I would say like in terms of like, you know, intangible benefits that come with doing this, um, whether it's, you know, Eastern Land where there's like a group of 10 of us or eight um, that, you know, that are like in this every single day that, you know, we talk about our stress and we talk about um, how things are going and we talk about, you know, the fact that we're still worried about, you know, what's going to happen in four months type thing. 
Um, but then you start to kind of get into a more larger universe and you realize there's a lot of people out there that are risking everything to try and make something they believe in. And there is truly kind of like this code, this language, this understanding amongst people who are entrepreneurs that, you know, that don't own six boats yet. You know, like the, those of us that are still completely and totally in the trenches that like for the two of us, like we cannot claim success. We're so, so far from it. And I don't know if that, you know, discounts everything we're saying here today, but I think there's a lot of warnings. So I feel, I still think it's, I think it's, I think there's merit. Um, but there is, you know, there is like a code. There's like a, a, a quiet head nod and just a kind of a quiet respect for people that go out there and have chosen, I say, I say this on the video so you guys can watch it again. Like there's a, there's a group of people that have chosen to live for a few years like most people won't so they can rib, live the rest of their lives like most people can't. And that is kind of a driving, you know, mantra, if you will, that has really kind of paid off in what we call like this cave of secrets. You know, you don't know about all this stuff until you risk everything, until you take this leap that is terrifying, absolutely terrifying, but incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of our choose your own adventure. Um, I think the, you know, both of us kind of have a few parting points. Mine, mine would be this. Um, don't forget for a second, like, how incredibly talented you guys are um, and how much you're learning here that is making you better than every single creative person that's going into business right now. I'm telling you, both of us have seen it. Your professors tell you all the time, but they're like your mom, like they believe in you, so it didn't really count. Um, like we're telling you as objective third parties, like you guys will know more and be better than I would say a huge percentage of the people you're gonna go up against, right? So the piece that you need to consider, right? And both from, a, from so many different angles is start a business. Like start a business immediately. It doesn't mean that you have to quit or not go to that agency that you absolutely wanna work at or that brand that you wanna go to. Um, but there's gotta be something else. I'm 100% sure that like you're interested in, right? There's a revenue model for that, right? So if you can spend, call it an, you know, two hours on a weekend, like slowly building up towards something, like there's an end game in that, right? Both from the perspective of if you start a business while you're working at an agency and not making shit for money, because you won't when you start, you're gonna have another source of revenue. Like that's another revenue channel. On top of that, it actually keeps your attention not just dialed on one thing, which is gonna make you a better creative. And then I think, you know, the third piece of that being, you know, for whatever the percentage of you guys that do something like that and then stick with it, like you may find that that little thing that you kind of spent, you know, Sunday afternoons working on, like where you're, you know, still kind of like nursing a hangover, but you could still type, like you worked on this little business idea, like that may become your life. Like that may give you the ability to bail from what is a traditional life or a traditional career path and make you not only lots of money, but incredibly happy personally as well. I feel like my takeaway is a little more sneaky than Jordan's, and this is uh, to second years, and if you first years ever remember us talking by the time you graduate, if you guys are already dreaming up something or, you know, have an idea or I'm just going to be in this game for a little bit, you know, why not start looking for places? You guys are paying money to learn right now. Why not get paid to learn from another company? Why not search for the job that will help you on your next job as opposed to just getting it? Find the, you know, find the agency that has the brands or has the skills that you want to take to your own job. Make them pay you to learn everything. That's what I did at Widen. I was there hanging out and getting on the briefs that were teaching me more things. It wasn't where I could get a home run. It was where I was going to fail spectacularly. And there was a lot of that. But, you know, get paid to learn. Don't go right out of the gates and just think you're going to make a ton of money. Spend a few years, get paid to get, to get educated again. And then when it's all over and you have your own business, you're paying yourself to learn. The learning never stops. You just need to be able to take it in. But just let someone pay you for a little bit. Yeah. Fully recommended. Thank you guys very much.